Uh, so, uh, first, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what complexity science is. So, for the people who were there yesterday, you'll, you already know, right? And <laughs> why it's interesting. Um, and then we'll have to talk about um, mathematics of change. That doesn't mean that you need to do like calculations or something like that. Um, but um, it is a bit different. So there is a mathematics that describes change, change processes. And uh, often uh, people who study psychology are not trained in those methods. Um, and um, so we'll look at that. I have some assignments that you can do in a spreadsheet. So you don't need any special skills or special uh, software to be able to, uh, to do these things. And, and you'll notice that you'll be able to yeah, look at some very interesting dynamical phenomena using very simple models. Uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about uh, some basic uh, time series analysis. And, and this is a little bit optional. This is if we, if we get there. Right? But it's also interesting stuff. Um, OK, so a little bit about uh, complexity science. Um, <coughs> this, this is a, um, a program which was started in the Netherlands. NWO is the Netherlands uh, the funding um, uh, organization. And um, they have now, they already have a second one, but, but it's uh, like, a, like a call for researchers from across all disciplines to start uh, studying um, complexity. And uh, it actually does a very nice job in explaining also what complexity is. Okay, oh, I used to have a link up here to the poll, so I'll put it up here. Um, uh, it's a nice reference for you to, yeah, to, uh, to get kind of a summary uh, of uh, what uh, complex systems are. Um, <coughs> but there are some essential topics that they treat in this, uh, in this theme, and they, well, of course, the first one is, is time, so dynamics, right? So um, uh, if you want to study uh, complex systems, like living systems, like human beings, what you'll notice is that they will change over time. And, and so dynamics is a very essential part of uh, studying the complex systems. How, what is their temporal evolution? Also, because these systems are very complex, they have many different parts that work together, might interact, there are different levels of analysis. And they call this, in this folder, they call this uh, uh, mi micro macro. So it's usually the case that once you've identified an interesting phenomenon you want to study, you can usually identify, let's say, a low level uh, of analysis which has well, lots of components that sort of cause uh, behavior at a global or at a macro level. Like, for instance, yeah, you might study individuals, uh, and then, of course, wh where you put them in groups, they might do something different than you would expect based on uh, what you know about the individual. Right? So that would be a micro or macro level. But I'll talk about uh, some other uh, types of levels uh, in biology and physics. Self-organization is <coughs> is a term for a real physical process that, um, that is used to describe what happens when complex systems change from one state into another state. And, um, and the reason it's called self-organization is that it's, um, yeah, there's, there's nobody telling the system what to do. There's no not one part that is in control and guiding this reorganization. It's really a, a, a structural reorganization of the system as well. And I'll show you examples of that as well. Um, and then the second, uh, or the, the last thing, which is uh, very important that I, I did not discuss yesterday, and hopefully we can discuss it uh, today a little bit, is this idea of scale invariance. And that's what you're looking at here. Um, so it turns out that if you have these complex systems, and in this case we're looking at uh, maybe the Earth's atmosphere as a complex system, um, you, can, you can zoom in on smaller and smaller scales, and it turns out that a lot of the things that you encounter there actually look a little bit like what you found at the, at the larger scale, right? So uh, that's what, what is meant by scale invariance. It's if you zoom in, down, or up, it will not be exactly the same, but there will be very many um, um, similarities. Not a word for this, is self-similarity. Um, and of course, associated to this is uh, the idea of uh, fractals, fr fractal geometry. So at near the end of the day, uh, hopefully we can talk a little bit about the fractal structure that, are, uh, that, that you can find in 
time series of community behavior. Okay, so those are so those are the main uh, uh, characteristics of complex systems and the, the main things that are involved when you're doing complex system systems uh, research. Um, so if you want to have a very boring definition of complexity science, it's a scientific study of complex dynamical systems and networks. Hopefully you can also, maybe on the last day, talk a little bit about these complex networks because that's um, very very much related to uh, what, what I'm going to talk about today and tomorrow, but uh, yeah, there are some, some twists and some, some things that are a little bit um, uh, different also in terms of analyses, um, but also very interesting. Um, so <coughs> um, the, the thing is, complexity science is not really uh, one uh, discipline. So. You, you see now more often that universities will have a complex systems center or, or something like that. But what it means is that they put in there uh, people from all kinds of different backgrounds. Right? And this can be uh, well, from physics to biology to uh, computer science. Um, and um, yeah, all, all, all of those people will, will, t will tell you that they study uh, complex uh, systems and that they're part of uh, complexity science. And this is sort of a little bit of a of a historical uh, picture here uh, where you have information theory from the 50s and dynamical systems theory from well, the 60s, 70s, and, um, and, and, and these are more recent uh, um, developments. Um, and the thing is, if you, if you look carefully, it's very difficult here to find anything from social science, right? So there is maybe you have um, social networks here, Bit, but um, yeah, we're, we're, I, I think we're missing here. We should, should, we should be in there because we, we're studying probably the most complex system of all, uh, which is human behavior and, and humans. Um, so, uh, so maybe one, one of the goals is uh, for me to give these workshops is also to get us in somewhere here. And, and one of the ways in, uh, and I talked about this a lot yesterday, so, so I won't repeat that here, but we'll, we'll come to talk about it as we go along, is um, ideographic science. So the sort of the, yeah, I think maybe we can already call it a little bit of a movement, um, uh, which is the idea that, that what we need as, as a behavioral science is, is really a science of the individual, and not a science that is based on samples, very large groups. Um, and um, I will uh, show you some arguments of why that's probably a bad, bad thing to do, it happened with it yesterday also. Um, but the idea of, of, of personalized interventions, personalized diagnosis, and really the science of the individual, also if you're thinking about like uh, uh, learning, like educational science, uh, there's a lot of work going on in, in figuring out um, uh, if it's possible to actually yeah, uh, tailor make uh, learning programs, but also intervention programs uh, for the individual. And that's typically not something that, that these uh, disciplines are using complexity science for, but I think it's very, um, um, well, it offers all the tools you would need to build a science like that. Okay, so I have already mentioned a couple of times the word system and the word complex. So before we can continue, I uh, have to explain a little bit. But what I mean by that, um, so a system, very general, uh, definition would be uh, an entity that can be described as a composition of components according to one or more organizing principles, right? And, and very often the, mo the most simple organizing principle is you, you draw like a circle or a boundary around some components and you say, okay, that's my system. I could say this room is about a system, no, no problem. Um, it's, it's really as general as that. Um, now, the systems have diff can have different pro properties, and, and these organizing principles, or the type of, of, of organizing principles that you would choose, uh, and the type of components that you then have inside your system, they do decide uh, what uh, kind of uh, well, phenomena you might expect when you're studying these systems. Right? Um, so, uh, one of the most important distinctions is, is to figure out whether your system is an open or a closed system. So a closed system um, would be a system <coughs> that cannot exchange any energy or information with its environment. 
um, and, and just is uh, uh, no, uh, studying the dynamics, it would just be studying the dynamics within uh, the system boundary. And actually, I think if you think really hard about it, there is only one closed, really closed system, uh, natural closed system that we know of, and that's the universe. And, and probably all other systems are in some way uh, uh, exchanging information or heat or energy with the environment. And, and uh, yeah, those systems are open systems. And there is a, a degree of openness um, that systems can have, right? So uh, uh, if you would have like an oven or something, uh, uh, those are generally well isolated from the environment in terms of heat exchange. So it's not perfect. And, um, uh, but if you think about living organisms, human beings, but also basically any living organism that is, uh, well, at least in some way a little bit social, um, these are, are very open, very open systems. So um, when I talk about continuous exchange of matter, energy, and information with the environment, it's really about, it, it's really everything. So it's the fact that we eat, it's the fact that when we move around, we increase the temperature, <laughs> but it's also the fact that I'm producing sound waves here, and you're you know, sort of able to understand what's going on there. Yeah. That's information. Um, uh, so we're very, very open, and, and um, uh, uh, usually uh, what happens if you have these open systems is that, that these boundaries can become also a little bit fluid. So, for example, um, um, yeah, when you're having a conversation with someone, it's very easy to, to sort of uh, lose this boundary and become one with your conversational partner. Well, not, not exactly one, but it's, you can be described as one, one system uh, with maybe its own dynamics. And if you connect to another person, you, you maybe have different dynamics. So, so these systems can couple with each other, decouple, and have all kinds of interesting uh, behavior. So the more open the system, the more interesting uh, usually the behavior is. All right. So that's very basic about what systems are. I didn't talk about the components that are inside the system. Um, um, but um, uh, you can imagine that these organizing principles uh, will uh, have to be formulated in a way uh, um, that describes how these components can interact with each other, or if they even can interact with each other. So uh, that really decides the type of dynamics that you might expect. Um, in these systems. So if you would have, so suppose we can really make this room a closed system, really shut it off. And I would have like a, a bottle of perfume here and, and, and take the lid off and then just leave it. Then if you wait long enough, the distribution of the, all the molecules in the perfume would be completely homogeneously distributed in this, in this room, right? Um, and the way you would describe this in, in terms of these systems and this you can only get really get in a, in a closed system, is that th the system started out in a, in a state that was really highly ordered. It was all contained within a little bottle. And after a while, uh, it turned into a state of uh, maximal disorder or maximal entropy. And we'll talk about what that exactly means. Um, and, but those are basically the dynamics for closed systems. Right? So, so what closed systems will do, and, and the kind of things you will see there, is that highly ordered states will dissipate into uh, completely disordered, homogeneous states. And, and these open systems, what they can do is they can add energy to their internal environment in order to uh, maintain this, uh, this high order. So, well, in the case of, uh, of this bottle of perfume, I could just spend energy and screw the lid back on and then it would stay there. But, but I could also do other things like come in with a blow dryer and heat up all the molecules around or something like that. But the thing is if you if you cannot add any energy, if you cannot add any information or matter, um, which is the case for closed systems, then then the end will always be this this state of maximal uh, disorder. And um, and yeah and open systems they usually want to maintain their internal structure, their internal complexity. And in order to do so, they need to spend um, energy to maintain this. Okay. So that's the, that's the main distinction between uh, open and closed. Uh, can I ask 
contribution yeah. about that previous slide. Uh, so if all systems are open to a degree, uh, is it the built-in assumption in the mathematical methods that are used to like describe these systems? Or is the closedness of a system like a working assumption like the normality of the distribution in statistics? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, th this, of course, is usually uh, uh, plays a role if if you uh, in physics, right? So, so you have to be if you want to do calculations and those kind of things, you have to be able to decide decide how close your system is. Um, so they will have uh, they will have equations for that and models, and they can estimate you know, whether or not uh, uh, right so you will end up with this maximum entropy state and those kind of things. But uh, in general, in psychology. Um, there aren't really a lot of uh, theories or um, models that, that really take those things into account. So there is, of course, uh, I now know, remember the name yesterday, I couldn't remember, Friston's uh, free energy principle models. Um, and, and, and they talk about uh, how a system can, can, can expand free energy and, and transform it into, uh, into actions, basically. Uh, but that's, I think, the only one. And in general, the, I think the, the main assumptions for, st for statistics in, in psychology are, uh, have to do, we'll, we'll talk about that, but they have to do uh, with, um, with uh, uh, how, yeah, uh, do I assume that my components actually can interact with one another and how, what does that interaction look like? Is that complex interaction, multiplicative, or is it just additive? Uh, that's the main difference for, um, yeah, for, for behavioral science. Um, oh yeah, so uh, another one of the, these, the, uh, and what I forgot to tell you is that the, co the components inside a complex system can of course be complex systems themselves. And they can be o open and usually are. So what I just described, right, if you have like one individual and then you put them in a group and you say the group is now my system, then that is of course a system made up of complex systems. But also inside our bodies we have lots of complex systems, right? So I think we have more microbes in our gut than neurons in our brain, and they're not not—they're not just sitting there, <laughs> they're doing something, right? So that's a, that's a complex system that's communicating, and, and we don't know, even know fully what they're doing. But um, uh, yeah, we're, we are also built up of uh, pretty complex systems. Also the immune system is one of those really complex uh, biological systems. Um, so when you're talking about micro and macro levels in a system, yeah, that's really up to the up to you to decide what those levels are, right? So you have to figure out where the interesting stuff is going on. So what are the interesting phenomena? What is um, uh, where are the interesting dynamics? Um, and uh, well, uh, uh, very well studied examples uh, are of course uh, swarming and schools. Um, <coughs> um, so the components there are, are fish or, or birds, and, and, and what, what happens if they, yeah, if there are, I think usually it's, uh, it has to do with uh, sort of a critical number of these uh, birds or fish, they will start to uh, behave uh, as if they are one organism. So you can describe the dynamics of a swarm um, by not, um, not even knowing what every single bird is doing or what every single fish is doing. Um, and, and it starts sort of starts to act like, like an entity of itself with its own dynamics. And this is uh, one of the famous examples uh, from, uh, from mathematics, uh, cellular automata. It's artificial life. I'm going to try if this, this, will, if this will actually be a video thingy. No, no it's just a picture. Okay. But this, this, this moves. <laughs> and it's just a very simple uh, uh, mathematical uh, equation, uh, it's a very simple rule, it's something like, you know, if there's a, if, if the surrounding box is, is also black, then the next box will also be black. Kind of very simple rule. Um, but they, they, these kind of rules, they can serve for uh, explaining uh, this uh, natural behavior. So for instance, I think for birds, they have these models in which they, the, the only rule is to 
at a certain distance from your next uh, neighbor on both sides, and then maintain a certain airspeed or something like that. So there's like two rules that, that you that, that these birds should follow, and and taken together, so the, 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 their interactions as a group uh, will then uh, create these uh, these swarm patterns. And and there are obviously there are some uh, biological advantages of being in the swarm. You're safe from predators. The, the net uh, casualties, because predators will get, of course, some of these birds, but they are much less than if they would be uh, solitary birds, right? And so we would call these patterns emergent. So they emerge, the patterns, but also the dynamics, they emerge from the micro level, and it's very often not very obvious what will happen. Um, so this uh, schooling uh, uh, behavior is, is not very obvious. So if you just have one fish or one, or one bird and you can study everything about this bird, you will not know what happens if you put two or three or uh, some critical uh, number of them together. Um, and this is really one of, the, one of the features of complex systems, right? So the emergence you really only get in complex systems when you have uh, many different components uh, together. Uh, but the thing is, this holds also for, for physics, for non-living matter. So you can imagine if you were like an alien scientist coming here and well, I, I think water is plenty in the universe, so that, that's not a good example, but suppose um, you ne you've never seen uh, water and you are, you're only living a water molecule. Right? You really do not know the properties of water like vapor, ice, those kinds of things. You cannot know any of these properties if you don't see a, a volume of, of water, uh, a body of water uh, together. And the same thing with this, or if you would be, if they would be given uh, like a, an ant, right? And, and you can study all the behaviors of this ant in isolation, but you, you could, would never predict if you don't have the context, if you don't know anything about the environment, that they can actually build these ant hills and, and have a very complex social uh, societies. And so, so if you sometimes hear physicists talk about complexity uh, in their field, what they actually mean is that, that those, they, they are talking about systems that have more than three particles. That's already complexity for uh, physicists. Um, okay. So some very um, uh, well-known, I think, uh, um, uh, phenomena uh, that we can observe uh, uh, when we have this micro-macro distinction um, is, uh, well, the, the idea that systems can uh, change their behavior, their structure, their internal structure, and, um, and their uh, global dynamics. Um, and what we would call this are phase transitions, right? So we know that if you put liquid water on a pan and, and heat it up, um, you will eventually uh, notice that it will uh, become vapor. And if we make it cold, it will become solid. Um, and so, yeah, you really need to know the entire system and, and put it through some, uh, some experiments, let's say, um, uh, to be able to figure out uh, what's going on there. Um, so the, the forms and the properties uh, are emergent and not expected from the components. Yeah, so one mo water molecule does not possess the property wet. That's really a property of, uh, of, this, of, of the system of, of water molecules. So <clears throat> if you uh, put this little literature in, 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 this, in this schematic sense. So in physics, of course, we have the luxury that we have some very good theories about what is going on at these levels, right? At the micro and the macro level. So, so at the micro level, we have molecules and atoms. Of course, there's quantum below that, but for this analysis, we don't really need to bother with that. Um, so we have uh, those, uh, those we, we know sort of the mechanics that, that are going on there. We know what these, uh, these molecules or atoms can do. And, uh, and we've studied this enough, so we also know when, well, these, uh, these if you put them together in a, in, a, in a large system, what will happen to, um, uh, to the macro level. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, you would have these uh, thermodynamic uh, uh, 
quantities like temperature, volume, and pressure that are deciding what is going on with these uh, states of matter um, and energy and entropy, of course. And um, <clears throat> so here we also have a so oh yeah that this is important so thermodynamics is a, is a, is a physical theory that the, that can describe all these things so it's also the transitions between these states right from solid to vapor but actually the theory here doesn't need to know anything about the, about this right so. Uh, thermodynamics was developed and completely developed before, let's say, uh, there was uh, the connection was made between what's going on at the atomic level and and this level. Uh, so, so the, 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 this micro, these micro level dynamics can be, let's say, a world of their own, and 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 you don't really need to know about what's going on here. And it's a perfectly valid theory. So, but we also have a very good theory about the mechanics of these uh, of these particles. And then uh, there is uh, something called uh, statistical mechanics, which is a, a theory that connects these levels, right? So, and it's actually a theory of averaging. So it's saying, yeah, okay, you can sort of think about uh, ensembles of atoms moving, they have a particular energy, and you can sort of average this, and then you will find, if you do the calculations correctly, you will find uh, the right uh, temperature that thermodynamics already gave you without knowing anything about it, yeah? Um, so this is really a very nice picture that you that, that they have in physics. And now the question is, what can we do? What can we do in behavioral science? Uh, well, lots of things to be filled in, and also maybe not very clear what these levels should be. Um, so I think in neuroscience, well, you would probably say that we have uh, at the micro level we have the neurons. And then maybe at the top level we have behavior, cognition, development. Uh, very rarely they would say, well, well, maybe the, the really the physiological type of neuroscience, they would be interested in the relationship between what single neurons are doing and, and what groups of neurons are doing. But that's usually not what, what we do in behavioral science. We go straight from, <laughs> from you know, observing that some brain areas are active to what's going on at the behavioral level without thinking too much about the scale differences there. Um, uh, yeah, but you can, of course, fill in many uh, different things here. And, and well, that's, that's uh, um, of course, because we are very complex systems. But then, <coughs> uh, uh, once you have that, so in physics, they have nice theories that describe what is going on at these different levels. Um, but, but we, I, I don't think we really, we really have those. Um, a lot. At least, let's say, we don't have. We may have a lot of theories, but we don't have consensus theories, right? So nobody is contesting that the, that the theory of uh, the kinetic motion of, of uh, gases or the, 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 the laws of mechanics uh, for atoms uh, should be disputed or, or in some way. I mean, that's you probably wouldn't know what that actually means if you would say that. And, and the same holds for thermodynamics. I mean, uh, very few people will, will contest that, that that's a real theory. Um, but, uh, but, but we might have like hundreds of theories for these different levels and don't, don't even know which one should be uh, the one uh, uh, that's most uh, truth-like, let's say. And then, and then, of course, to establish a connection between those will, will be very difficult if you don't even know what's going on there. So, so if you would, would think this is an interesting, uh, uh, let's say, uh, well, research perspective on what, uh, how to study complex systems, lots of work to do here, <laughs> lots of work to do. Um, so I, I, my, my point is that, that usually what, what we do in, in behavioral science is not even take those really uh, physical levels, let's say, into account. So there might be different levels of analysis, right? We have Mars levels of analysis. Uh, but they don't really describe uh, different levels in physics. They describe um, uh, yeah, really uh, sort of uh, um, conceptual levels. OK. Uh, so let's, let's fill this just in maybe a little bit uh, uh, general. Uh, so suppose it makes sense to, to have a microscopic and a macroscopic level. Um, uh, here at the 
bottom, we have many coupled processes and components. You have to remember that, that, that for these uh, statistical mechanics to work, it's not the case that the physicists claim that they know what, what each and every particle is doing. Right? But, but they know that, that what, they know what the behavior of these things can be within some boundaries, and then they can sort of estimate what their group behavior would be, what they would be doing in, in ensembles. And actually, the, 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 the sort of assumptions they need to do this, so the assumptions to, to make these averages <coughs> that uh, connect it to the, uh, to the thermodynamics, uh, those are actually the assumptions that our statistics also use. Um, so when we take a sample of uh, people and then start to do our statistical inferences, um, yeah, the assumptions we need in order to, 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 make, to ensure that this average of the sample that we get actually means something are actually the same assumptions you need for particles. And of course, yeah, that might be uh, not a valid assumption uh, if you think that the components uh, that we have in these samples are actually not very simple components but uh, are complex systems in themselves. Um, but we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, so, I think a lot of the things that we are talking about uh, in uh, behavioral science using the tr more traditional methods uh, are already collective or global variables, right? So they, they are summaries of, of, of things that might be going on here. It's just that we uh, often assume that there's a one-to-one -one relationship with some, with some lower level uh, components and we actually um, uh, really don't have a good idea of how to couple these methods. But um, um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about maybe some options um, tomorrow. Um, you might have to, to actually tap into this, this microscopic level without knowing everything about what's going on at that microscopic level. So complexity science does give you some tools that you might that might give you a hint of what's going on here without being uh, uh, very explicit about what that is. But it might give you information of what's going on there. But we'll talk about that uh, tomorrow. So time to give you some uh, nice examples of this, uh, of all the things that can happen to these complex systems that have these microscopic and macroscopic dynamics. Um, I, I showed you this uh, 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 yesterday also, but it's such a nice example that we'll talk about it again. <laughs> so this, these are uh, amoeba, uh, dictyostelium, um, and uh, there's a, a very, very well-studied organism, they're single-celled organisms, and they, uh, they feed on uh, bacteria, and they're everywhere in the, in, in the soil. And, um, uh, uh, and if there's enough fee, fee, uh, food, if there are enough uh, bacteria, nothing, uh, nothing happens. They just stay very nice, happy, single-celled amoeba, and they uh, can divide and uh, conquer the soil. Um, but if the food is exhausted, they uh, aggregate, so they, they get together, they uh, huddle in the, in the mound, and um, uh, they form so these, these things that used to be individual cells, get together and they form a multicellular slot. And this, so it becomes sort of, yeah, a different organism, you could say. Um, and it, it has a head and a tail, and the slot migrates towards heat and light, because, well, where there's heat and where there's light, there might be bacteria. And um, if it gets there, it will uh, form a, uh, a sporing body, which means it becomes kind of a, a plant. <laughs> and from this plant, um, new amoeba uh, emerge, and uh, they can feed on the bacteria that, uh, that, they, that the slug found. And this all takes just 24 hours. So what I did not show you yesterday is, uh, but I did tell you about this, um, is that th this, is, this is pretty miraculous. I mean, the first time I, I saw this, I thought, well, what is going on here? But um, this process can actually be described, or at least the phases in this process, uh, by, uh, well, not too complex um, computational models. So I'll, 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 sh I'll show you them uh, in a moment. Um, but first, let's, let's see what this looks like, right? So here they are. 
freely moving, it's the bacteria, the food is going down, they hold together, and they create these really strange patterns. By the way, these patterns are very similar to something called the Belusov Sobotinsky reaction, which was one of the first discoveries in, um, the, in chemistry that chemistry is actually not uh, a static uh, science, but uh, it can, uh, can be very dynamical. Um, and this is the slug. So this is from an experiment. So they, they made some coloring of the cells. But yeah, it has a, it has a head and a tail that uh, migrates towards light. And then here this uh, sporing body uh, comes up. And uh, yeah, we have new, new uh, bacteria. Um, yeah, so what I, what I put up together here is, so this thing here is called uh, a phase diagram. And this uh, describes the different states of matter. So we talked about what happens when you put water, right? Uh, you turn the heat on water. It can be uh, liquid, uh, vapor, solid. Uh, and, and you can see that they've identified some more uh, states that we usually do not encounter, like uh, compressible or supercritical, uh, those kind of things. Um, there's also a triple point. Did you know this? Um, so there is a point where um, water can be ex exactly in uh, uh, the same three states. So it can be in vapor, liquid, and uh, solid phase uh, all at once. If you want to uh, look at this, follow this link, and you can see a nice uh, video uh, where uh, this is actually happening. Um, but the, the point here is that what you see here on these axes is you have here a temperature axis, uh, a pressure axis, and and these variables basically control what, kind of what is going on at the macro level. And, and these are thermodynamic quantities, right? So they don't tell you anything about what's going on at the level of, of the atoms. But they are actually uh, yeah, well, collective variables, if you uh, think about it. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and this thing here, it really is kind of a, is a qualitative description of what's going on with matter. So it's real physics. But this is just qualitative, right? So this is vapor is just the name that we give to the, the, what, what, what matter is doing in this, in this region. And, um, and, and you could do the same thing here, right? So you could, you could describe these things. They're qualitatively different states of the system, just like you have qualitatively different states here. And um, uh, if, if, you, if you named this, <laughs> right? If you attached labels to these qualitatively different states, you've actually created a variable. So let's say the, the, the dynamics of uh, these qualitative states, so how they su uh, succeed one another, um, uh, is described by something called the order parameter. The order parameter. So it's very often a qualitative description of the macro states of a system. There's also something called the control parameters, so in this case, it's temperature, pressure, and control parameters decide, yeah, what, what state, uh, or in what, uh, you can think about them as coordinates, um, in what region of this phase diagram you're actually in. So this, uh, this is not uh, very sequential. This is kind of sequential because once they're, I think once they're a slug or once they're here somewhere, uh, they can't really go back anymore. So they have to complete the cycle or they all die or something like that. But uh, uh, so there's a, there here. There's really a sequence uh, to this um, um, uh, to this uh, dynamics. Uh, but here you can uh, yeah. Well, of course you have to temperature has to be increased, right? You cannot immediately have a particular temperature. So there's some dynamics in there. But but usually in these phase diagrams, uh, time is really uh, left out of it. Okay. So so those are two important. Um, um, terms you need to know. So, so the order parameter is describing what's going on at the macro level, and it's often just labeling. So it's just, look, now it's a slug. Look, now it's a sporing body. Look, now it's vapor. And, uh, and the control parameter is are the, uh, parameters are the variables that make them uh, well, change uh, their order or change their behavior. OK, so here. Uh, the order parameter is, of course, the availability of uh, food, and it's actually uh, 
a chemical that they release uh, when they get hungry. <laughs> the kind of pheromone uh, thing that sets this all in motion. Okay. So, neural parameters correlate in two different states. Control parameter is the food that's available. So, what would you, what kind of experiments would you do if you are dealing with a system like this? Um, well, you would not put them in a cubicle behind the screen and measure response times or something like that. <laughs> but, um, well, yeah, you start to ask more kind of process questions, right? So, so this is reversible. So if we add food here, will they go back to the individuals, right? Uh, uh, maybe perturb the system. So what happens if, uh, if we pick them up and put them in another place or something like that? Um, so they, they, the questions you start to ask once you already have these, this sort of idea that, that you're dealing with processes on different levels are more like, uh, what, what can we learn about the relationship between those levels? Or can we uh, just focus on one level and, and figure out if that's uh, how stable that is? Um, and, um, and usually these things are described in terms of, um, and I talked about this yesterday at uh, some length, um, basically about the, the, the degrees of freedom uh, the system has for uh, generating its behavior. So if you think about these uh, amoeba as individual cells that can walk around anywhere, uh, right? So the system has a very large number of degrees of freedom. And usually what happens if, if these, um, yeah, if, the, if these different uh, versions of the order parameter, these different forms um, are uh, going to emerge, is that there is some, some kind of uh, uh, constraint on the degrees of freedom of the system. Um, and this usually causes the emergence of these new forms. Usually because, well, they, they, uh, the restriction in, the, in this case just means that they are getting much closer, that all kinds of interactions happen that would never happen if they uh, would be uh, able to uh, freely move around. Okay. Um, Oh, this one will be probably not too uh, I'll take it off. So now let's let's see how we could we could uh, or how this is modeled actually. Um, um, so yeah, the the the, the uh, free moving amoeba. It's just a, a one equation and it's just kind of a sum. At some point you don't really have to know what's going on there, but uh, um, uh, it's it's really um, uh, I showed you this. Uh, this, uh, this very simple thing that is mimicking the swarm be swarming behavior. It's called a cellular automaton. So they, they model this also using the, uh, the cellular automata. Um, and they can, um, uh, yeah, they have all, all kinds of rules uh, uh, of things that can happen if, if uh, these amoeba touch. Um, and I think this is actually a, a bacteria, something like that. But they can also sort of model this, this behavior that the amoeba will engulf the bacteria. Um, and then yeah, what's going on when they, uh, when they huddle together is, uh, is described by a number of equations. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, the dynamics of the slug uh, is something that you can model using three equations. Um, and then uh, what's going on here is also uh, uh, possible to model. And when I say model, I mean, um, so I don't mean, of course, you, you can just make like a, an animation or something like that, but, it, but it's a computational mechanism uh, that is actually representative of this idea of self-organization. Okay, so the rules that they put into the computer models are not like uh, uh, telling the system what to do, but uh, they, are, they are rules for the evolution, basically, of the, of the components, just like these very simple rules that you need to describe what is going on in the school of uh, flocking birds. Um, uh, here you have these uh, very simple rules for um, um, yeah, describing what these cellular automata do. And, uh, and that, that, that can give you, so the, these simple rules can give you really pretty complex, complex behavior. This is another example. Um, how to get uh, complex structures from very simple rules. These are Thermite, thermite, <laughs> um, 
really complex uh, structures built by very simple insects. And um, these things have stuff like uh, air conditioning and, and all those kinds of things. Uh, it's something to do with the, the length of the, the, the canals that are in there. But if you uh, think, of, if, if, you, if you look at what the, well, the, one of the explanations is of how these uh, little animals can build this without having like an overseer or, or someone telling them uh, where to put uh, the pieces of dirt because this is just soil, right? So what you see here is just, uh, just soil or mud that's, that's lying around. Um, um, it's actually, actually um, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's a very simple system, but it's, yeah, uh, but it creates very uh, interesting emergent uh, properties. So, um, this is a kind of an attempt to, to describe <laughs> what you need to, uh, to get this, right? So if you would have a random system, uh, or, or yeah, let's just say what these things can do, right? So these termites, they can fly, not always, I think, but at some point in their development, they can fly. And they can uh, pick up dirt and drop it at some place, right? So if you would have a random system that is just only uh, randomly dropping things, you would not get anything, right? You would not get any structure. You would just have really only a random um, uh, distribution of dirt. Um, a linear system, uh, usually uh, linear systems will give you uh, one thing. <laughs> so uh, maybe if, if every term, uh, uh, termite uh, dropped, uh, uh, had like a linear trajectory and dropped its dirt at one point, you would get a nice nice mound maybe, but, but not, nothing very, uh, very complex. So there would be no competition between, so they call this an equilibrium point, which means yeah, uh, a point where sort of the dynamic stops for a moment, because that's where the, the, the dirt has dropped. Um, so what you need is a nonlinear system, which actually has multiple equilibrium points, uh, which creates a kind of uh, competition between equilibrium points. And how does this work? It turns out that if these termites, when they pick up this dirt, they actually leave a, 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 a pheromone, a, a smell, uh, that is uh, creating a gradient. So um, um, when, when, they, when, they, when they drop something, um, th it's very likely that another termite will also go there and, and, and also drop something. And then this also has the smell on it, so this, this increases the smell at a particular point. Right, so the pheromone at a particular point. Um, so when they start out, it is actually kind of random. But because, well, each termite is attracted to this gradient, um, you will get uh, some locations that will just have more uh, uh, pheromone, and these will attract more and more and more um, uh, termites, and they will drop their dirt and drop their dirt. And then at some point, you will get that there will be two uh, sites that are pretty close, and they will, there we go, <laughs> right, first, so first you get these pillars, which you would expect if you would just have a linear system, but then you get this competition going on between sites, and you can see uh, what happens, so they, they sort of uh, uh, grow uh, towards one another, because um, I think they, they always tend to drop it on the top of the, of the, of the thing that they're building. So you get these arches, and then yeah, once you have an arch, actually, <laughs> because of the nature of this dirt, uh, you can get uh, plateaus and domes, and then yeah, there the process repeats itself. So you can get uh, uh, this whole thing going. And that's it. <laughs> Those are the rules that you need uh, to create this very complex uh, termite, termite cathedral. Um, and uh, the height has something to do with they just can't fly any higher, right? So all the constraints on the degrees of freedom that the system has to, to do the things are, are made by, by very, uh, very simple rules. Um, uh, so there are a couple of ingredients, of course. So there has to be this competition at some point, because otherwise you, you don't get a very interesting dynamic. And what, what you see very often is uh, 
Yeah, you have to have these kind of gradients of, of, of things. So, so in this case, it's a gradient of this pheromone that is sort of uh, luring these uh, termites into to, uh, to this uh, central point. Um, and um, yeah, you can, uh, uh, the, the, the actual term that we use in, uh, in uh, let's say, com complex system speak is, is the tracker. Right, so you can think about of this landscape as uh, a landscape full of points that are actually attracting these termites. So they're attractive uh, um, uh, regions. And, um, and uh, yeah, uh, this, this is a changing landscape, so there will be different points. But what you really need to have this, this attraction idea is a kind of gradient that pulls them into that location. So, um, yeah, we have very uh, simple local laws, and uh, um, yeah, they, they are actually, um, let's say, translations of, of well-known laws of thermodynamics um, that, that are used to describe this. Um, and the term, termite is kind of a particle in a gradient of these. Um, of course, uh, uh, what I already told you with this, uh, with this bottle, of perfume that you put in the closed system, uh, this requires energy, of course. So the, the environment has to be able to uh, um, yeah, sustain uh, the, these termites. There has to be food, there has to be materials, otherwise it doesn't work. Right? So you need, uh, you need some energy in order to build these things and, and, and also to maintain. Um, but very often in, in complex systems, you will find out that there are actually some there's at some level, there are pretty simple units that can interact with each other in simple ways. Uh, when I say simple, this is actually much more complex than the type of interactions that we, for instance, model when we do uh, do statistical analyses, um, right? Because they are, they are kind of uh, dynamical and, and multiplicative, um, and and you can have these things like feedback loops and competitiveness, uh, which you really cannot. Simple um, uh, linear models. Um, yeah, but termites are <laughs> more complex than uh, classical particles. So, yeah, you will probably not see this behavior if you put water molecules together and wait long enough. Uh, so, the fact that, that the termites as a system are themselves actually uh, small complex systems um, is probably the reason why we see this. Uh, um, so I think right now we have kind of a coffee break planned. In the is that correct? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. So um, I don't have a lot of yeah. Maybe I can show you this one, and then then we can go have some coffee. Um, uh, because this I already showed also showed you this uh, yesterday. <coughs> um, if you want to make a distinction between. You know the kind of uh, um, it's a bit, little bit contentious to call, call it classical approach, but <laughs> uh, the regular approach uh, to uh, studying behavior, right? You would be in this region in which you would say that the components of the system are actually well, kind of simple, but also their interactions are very simple. So, uh, right? So if you see a, 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 a global behavior, uh, you usually assume that it's kind of a simple addition of uh, components that, that uh, yeah, a linear arrangement of, uh, of, of, of components that, that cause uh, the observed behavior. But if you're going like the thing in a complex system perspective, means that you have many components and they interact in many different ways. They can be at different scales, uh, and it, it really matters that, that some things are going on at a scale that is much uh, smaller or faster than other uh, processes. Some of these things will not be, you know, communicating across scales, but some of them might. Um, and, um, and and you really need all these uh, interactions in order to be able to understand uh, how the complex uh, forms and complex dynamics emerge at the macro level. And um, so uh, after the coffee break, I'll uh, hopefully show you uh, and let you experience that that is actually the case. Um, so if you've, uh, I don't know if everybody has a laptop, but yeah. 
um, uh, you can see that it's that it's very easy to uh, to get uh, uh, well, let's say more than one form of uh, of dynamics from uh, from some very simple uh, simple models. Okay, so let's uh, have some coffee. <laughs>